Hello, and welcome to this introduction to narrative inquiry. My name is Dr. Debbie Laliberte Redman, and I'm a professor in the School of Occupational Therapy and the Health and Rehabilitation Sciences graduate program at the University of Western Ontario. I'm actively involved in teaching and doing qualitative research about health and social issues. I often use narrative inquiry because it provides such rich insights. Today I will address three key questions. What is narrative inquiry? What can be understood through narrative inquiry? And why do critical narrative inquiry? How do you define narrative inquiry? While there are different versions that have different paradigm assumptions, also there's ongoing debate about what counts as a narrative. For me, it's clear that narrative inquiry is more than just using a narrative or a storied approach to data collection. It involves listening, viewing, and interpreting narratives in particular ways. One key defining feature is the intent to invite stories, meaning that the interviewee is positioned as a narrator. One common mistake new researchers make is that they assume they have to ask a set of questions. The problem with that approach is that it does get in the way of people sharing their meaningful stories using words, content, and format that makes sense to them. A priority is given to narratives because stories are seen as a natural means of communication. Humans have a drive to story their experiences. Also, narratives are a form of verbal and social action. That is, they're not just a retelling of events, but they're dynamic, fluid, and active productions involving the shaping and ordering of experience. Within narrative inquiry, humans are viewed as meaning-generating organisms who draw on available contextual features in constructing narratives. They also influence their context context through their narratives. Narratives are something people use in everyday life as well as in research to make sense of their lives and aspects of their being in the world, such as time, space, relationships with others, and health and illness. As Lieblich notes, the story is one's identity, a story created, told, revised, and retold through life. As well, narratives are socially situated and contribute to the shaping of contextual elements. How a narrative is told is shaped within the larger social stories or discourses available to a person, as well as the norms, historical location, cultural understandings, and social conditions in which they are embedded. My second point is focused on the potential of narrative inquiry. An important distinction is that what we can understand are narrative truths, not historical truths. This aspect can be difficult to fully grasp given that traditional forms of research emphasize factual truth. However, as articulated in this quote, when talking about their lives, people lie sometimes, forget a lot, exaggerate, become confused, and get things wrong. Yet, they are revealing truths. These truths don't reveal the past as it actually was, aspiring to a standard of objectivity. They give us instead the truth of our experiences. Thus, while a narrative addresses a set of life events that have occurred, there are many different ways those events can be told. In this sense, narratives are always edited versions of a lived reality through which the narrator is trying to accomplish something. Understanding narratives is only possible through interpretation, which considers how a person is attempting to make meaning within context. For example, in my study about long-term unemployment, I found that people often presented themselves as activated job seekers through their narratives. When they talked about how much time they spent looking for and applying for jobs, I was less concerned about the accuracy of their time reporting and more attuned to how they were trying to present themselves. Aligned with the view of narratives as situated meaning making, it is not assumed that narratives are generalizable to a population or a specific type of experience. Rather, Narratives are examined for their particularity while also placing them in a context. A set of narratives from different individuals making sense of a particular type of event, such as making a healthcare decision, provides an understanding of what is possible and intelligible in a particular context. Just as generalizability is not a goal, narrative researchers avoid the illusion of causality. When a sequence of events is put together in a narrative, it can have an appearance of causal necessity. The important differentiation is that we can understand how people connect events in their lives, but that narratives do not prove that a particular factor actually caused an event. Drawing on the unemployment study, 
In their stories, narrators connected various life events and conditions to becoming unemployed. In our analysis, our focus was understanding how people made sense of becoming unemployed, not on identifying a list of causal factors. My third point focuses on narrative inquiry situated in a critical paradigm. This approach is very useful to highlight how social structures, systems, and practices shape situations of marginalization and constraint for particular collectives. This type of narrative inquiry is informed by critical social theories that attend to issues of power and the dialectic or the back and forth relationship between individuals and society. This variant emphasizes what can be discerned about the social through understanding individual narratives. As Hardin stated, it seeks to move data beyond level of the individual and into the historical, social, and cultural realms, making critical analysis possible on a social level. At the same time, this approach interprets narrators as active agents who continually negotiate their lives within the social. My aim is to interpret narratives to highlight constraining conditions shaped through discourses. In general, I'm referring to discourses as broad, socially constructed systems of meaning regarding a discursive object. In the case of the research I'll share, these objects are retirement, aging, and the aging body. The basic linking assumption is that narratives people tell are bounded within the discourses they have access to. As well, narratives illustrate systems in practice. That is, they make visible how dominant discourses addressing how people should be and what they should do, such as discourses addressing positive, active, successful aging, are negotiated in daily life. In this example, I'm highlighting findings from a critical narrative study. In this study, I looked at how people negotiate preparing for and living in retirement in relationship to positive aging discourses. We used an open-ended approach to narrative elicitation over two sessions with each of 30 informants, who self-identified as preparing for or being retired. We started with the prompt, tell me your story of preparing for or being in your retirement years. In talking about preparing for retirement, our research team expected narrators to address topics and issues like finances, housing, insurance, daily activities, and family. A very dominant and pervasive narrative thread we did not expect addressed preparing for and managing the aging body. In turn, I moved ahead with doing a critical narrative analysis focused on how people talked about aging bodies. To do this in ways that I could situate the body talk, I first examined how the body is discursively addressed within dominant positive aging discourses. I use the term positive aging discourses to encompass a range of discourses on aging, such as productive, healthy, or active aging, that have been taken up in policy, research, healthcare, popular and other texts and institutions over the past few decades. In relation to the aging body, such discourses emphasize the social responsibility and individual obligation of aging citizens to enact a proactive, disciplined approach to the body. They hold out the promise that an individual can manage bodily risks in ways that avoid aging decline and enable the prolonged achievement of youthful, healthy, functional, and independent bodies. I'm interested in how this imperative to enact a proactive, disciplined approach to the body is narratively negotiated by aging individuals. While not disagreeing that maintaining health is important, I'm critically concerned with how this has become an individual obligation, how health has been conflated with youth, and how those who eventually experience bodily decline and dysfunction may be marginalized. The questions here listed guided my interpretations. After plotting out major storylines of the narratives and trying various ways to question and code the data, I found that certain aspects of the narratives were especially fruitful to link discourses of aging and aspects of narratives addressing aging bodies. These included points of resistance, which occurred when narrators explicitly articulated they were doing or saying something that didn't fit with what they thought was expected. For example, when they talked about not exercising. Points of seeming contradiction happened when a narrator positioned themselves in ways that seemed to be in contradiction to each other. For example, describing oneself as youthful at one point and as feeling old at another point. 
Points of tension were points where narrators set up differences between themselves and others that resulted in marginalizing or blaming others for failed aging, or points where informants expressed being positioned as old by others. Finally, narrative linkages were the rationales informants built into their narratives to make sense of their situations in their bodies. In interest of time, I'm only focusing on two aspects of the findings that show the links between narrative and discourse. In line with positive aging discourses, informants actively strive to project themselves as people who were in control of their aging and had made choices to not let their aging bodies go. For example, a 45-year-old male conveyed that staying active physically was a big part of retirement planning for him and his wife, and that really is your lifestyle that influences how old you will look and that body work can enable you to look, act, and feel younger than your chronological age. Informants also frame themselves as having an obligation personally and societally to work on their bodies so as to keep them fit, youthful, and healthy. For example, a 61-year-old female emphasized that you have an obligation to try to prolong the healthy stage of your retirement and do everything you can do to stop it referring to bodily decline associated with aging and oldness. Informants provided detailed descriptions of how they engaged in various types of activities, such as dieting, exercising, and consuming age-defying products to monitor, maintain, and optimize their bodies. Concerns have been raised regarding how contradictions inherent in positive aging discourses may create tensions related to the need to endlessly work against the aging body. Aligned with such concerns, there were instances where narrators engaged in self-blame as they perceived they had failed to do the right body work. For example, a woman who had received a diagnosis of kidney disease remarked that although she didn't know anything at the time, she was working, she did it, the damage to her kidneys herself, because of her diet. In addition, some informants shared that despite their efforts to look, feel, and act young, they still encountered younger people who saw them as old. This points to the social limits of their body work and the resulting tensions and exclusions. One female participant told me, there's one store I don't go to anymore. They ask you when you go up there, are you 65? I resent being asked what age I am, so I won't go there anymore. At the same time as emphasizing their abilities to remain youthful for as long as possible, there also appeared to be a somewhat uncertain limit to the extent to which many were able to plan towards their futures as old showing the boundaries for planning established. That's the later part where you think, you know, don't kind of go there. That's the part you don't want to look at. This study provides an example of how critical narrative inquiry situates narrative in contemporary discourses. Specifically, the narratives provided insight into a range of tensions that can be experienced in facing the discursive imperative for unending engagement in body practices as a means to avoid oldness and stay forever youthful and fit. The findings raise concerns about how such discourses can perpetuate ageist perceptions, social, social exclusion of those who look and act old, self and other blaming for bodily decline, as well as self and body tensions. Ultimately, as Calisanti articulates, contemporary discourses increases both the burden of activity and the guilt for having the bodies we have. This highlights the need to reimagine re discourses of aging that are inclusive of the range of bodily changes that can occur. Such discourses would offer up desired possibilities for activity and identity for those whose bodies do decline. Further details regarding the study can be found on the reference listed. Finally, I would like to encourage you to further explore different approaches to narrative inquiry. How people story themselves, their experiences, and their everyday lives is a powerful means to understand health, identity, agency, and society. The potential of this methodology is further expanding, giving evolving approaches that integrate visual, artistic, digital, and other means to generate individual and collective narratives. These evolutions go beyond knowledge generation to spur social action. On this graphic, I have listed some key texts that provide good overviews of narrative inquiry and address details of methods. As well, the articles listed provide further details of the key points and approaches discussed in this talk. I hope this material has been helpful. 
I'm Dr. Debbie Liberté Rudman. Thanks for watching.